um, Arab Islamic community within Israel, that we have 10 centers that we're supporting and other initiatives uh, within the Arab sector, that they're deeply engaged in countering the terrible plague of violence going through the Arab sector right now. Unfortunately, as we come to the close of the year, we're at almost 130 uh, um, uh, Arab Israelis or Palestinians of 48, as they refer to themselves, having been killed in violence. And the ability to now train the sheikhs, the religious leaders, and women, and uh, young um, and, and, and young up-and-coming leaders within these communities with traditional mediation and modern mediation play a very important role. And this chapter has actually found its way being translated into different languages to help in that facilitation. Um, the second chapter, I start getting deeper into, uh, into Jewish texts. And here I'm looking at, who I already alluded to, Aaron, um, the older brother of Moses, the paradigmatic, uh, peacemaker within Judaism. I won't go to, I won't spend too much time talking about this right now, uh, but I really try to go into all the different legends that talk about Aaron through rabbinic text. I'm really focused on rabbinic text and the 1500 years of interpretation and commentary that there's so much wisdom of everyone kind of uh, arguing over how to read these texts and therefore sharing their wisdom about how to be a peacemaker. What I'll emphasize here once again is that Aaron, as the paradigmatic peacemaker, is a highly well-respected insider. Again, he's the elder, he's the high priest, he's a religious, a spiritual, he's a role model. Um, and that model is so similar to the Arab Sulha model um, and to other traditional non-Western models of peacemaking that sometimes for contemporary conflict resolution specialists, they'll look at it and be like, I don't even know what that is. That doesn't even look like mediation. Um, but when you realize the, 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 the traditional ways of how mediation and peacemaking is done, that's exactly how it's done. It's about a hug and a kiss at the end of the process. It's not just about a signing of an agreement and dividing up the scarcity of resources. It's about a, a, a it's often about stories of relationships that were deep and old, and then all of a sudden having them fall apart, and then having the insider who's deeply connected going back and forth and ultimately bringing about reconciliation and not just conflict resolution. And again, I have that and, and so many more of these kind of stories in, our, in my mind, in the mind of my team, as we go back and forth, uh, trying to engage the religious leaders on the extremes, um, the far right religious Zionists and uh, the Islamic movement to Hamas, and in ultimately trying to flip them into becoming part of the mediation network and not just as parts of the sides of the conflict. Um, third chapter, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention very briefly, goes into rabbinic texts in Talmudic time period and Midrash, that there, Aaron was not the only paradigmatic peacemaker. There were others uh, that the Talmud writes about as models of mediators of third parties. Sometimes they're highly respected rabbis. Sometimes they are very simple, uh, as a beautiful story about two jesters who are seem to be very, very simple individuals, but they strangely enough, become kind of like this other paradigm of how to behave and how to serve as a mediator. Uh, a couple of legends about women serving as peacemakers, and that's a whole other conversation uh, that I'm happy to talk about when we do Q&A in a few minutes, um, the role of women in all of this. Um, the fourth chapter, um, I talk about the role of rabbis as a uh, as, as mediators. David, this is the part you're supposed to listen to, okay? Um, I, uh, I am from, uh, I'm from Syracuse, New York. Uh, I grew up there as a child, and when I heard that there was a rabbi named Rabbi Yosef Syracusti, I'm like, I need to start the chapter with him. Um, rabbi Yosef Syracusti, who no one ever heard of him. He was the first rabbi to get the tzvat, to safed, in after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in Sicily. And he gets there before everybody else gets there. And he becomes known as this legend that's 
making peace within the Jewish community, between within the Muslim community, between their communities. And that gets passed on from generation to generation that the mitzvah, that the that the that the commandment, that the um that the that the whole weight of this tradition of seeking peace is not only an intra-Jewish conversation. And they learned that not from Aaron, who only served peace, who only worked for peace within the Jewish, within the Israelite tribes, but from somebody named Rabbi Yosef Syracuse, you never heard or heard of. So what would it look like if every fifth grader uh, in Jewish day schools and in Israel grows up knowing these legends as well? Um, we're going to come back to the man with the turban in a moment. That's uh, my ultimate hero of the book. His name his code name is the Chida, uh, Rab Chaim David Alevi Azulai. I will talk about him in a moment and why he's so important to me. Um, but I'll just say we have a program that connects what I can, I think, comfortably refer to as hardline uh, right wing religious Zionist rabbis to the world of mediation. They don't want to hear about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, they really don't want to hear about it but they do want to be connected to mediation. And uh, just today I was talking to, um, to a rabbi and a rabbinite uh, this morning, and they said, tell me who you are. And I said, oh, I wrote a book about rabbis and mediators. And I started talking about the different rabbis that I know that they're very much, um, that, that they're an authority for them, that they, that they, you can't not, you know, if you're that type of rabbi, be curious and be feeling connected. So, um, that's an important uh, component of just training rabbis to see themselves as mediators, as peacemakers, to learn professional mediation, to see themselves as continuing a long line of tradition of rabbis serving in that role. And then slowly, slowly connecting the rabbis and the sheikhs, as, uh, but that comes later. Um, the fifth and final chapter, I deal with lay leaders. Um, history of minhagim, of traditions, that are all over the Jewish world um, from the medieval time period till the state of Israel, um, where you have a really interesting phenomenon of people that are called rotfei shalom, pursuers of peace, mitzvchei shalom, mediators of peace, pashranim, compromisers, and nichbadim, just the honorary people. And what's so interesting to me is that when they're described, they're never described as an individual, Rodef Shalom. They're always described as Rodefei Shalom in the plural. It was always a network of people bringing their connections. It's, I'm connected to more of this side of the conflict. You're connected to that side of the conflict. We're going to work together and pull our connections to ultimately uh, come to an agreement and to reconcile. They take the initiative. They don't wait to be invited in very often. Um, you know, they are, they are, um, they are uh, as I noted, they're bringing about both pragmatic compromise agreements that relate to the actual tangible components of the conflict. And they're also trying to work in doing sort of what we see today in the Arab, uh, in the Arab traditional model of the sulha, where they'll have some kind of, you know, reconciliation at the end. So you see it in Spain, in Prague, Ashkenazi communities, Sephardi communities, in Morocco, consistently, um, and then pursuers of peace entered between them. And again, this is talking about within the Jewish community. This is not Jews and Muslims. This is within their community. This is part of how uh, Jewish communities would operate, that if there's a conflict in the community, it's everyone's responsibility to try to step forward and. And, and bring about reconciliation. This plays a really important role, um, first and foremost, because we support about 60 community mediation centers around the country. Uh, in two nights, two days from now on Tuesday, we have our uh, large gathering of our mediation conference where, we're, where we have generally COVID and Omicron aside. We have normally like 600 to 800 community mediators that are of all walks of life within Israel, that are volunteers that work within the community mediation centers in doing the most incredibly challenging types of, in, in, in mediating the most challenging types of conflicts. 
And they're really kind of continuing from my perspective, a lot of this tradition that had existed. But it also this, this chapter also plays a really important role in terms of, again, strengthen the sense of the insider mediators that I can't do it alone. It's not one person. It's a question of my connections and that person's connections. And once the rabbi and the sheikh who are deeply connected to the Islamist community and the religious Zionist community are working together as the mediators between their communities, not somebody from the outside, it makes a huge, huge difference in terms of their ability to pull their networks and bring about an agreement. Okay, so that was a, uh, a, a, a snapshot of, uh, of the book. And now I wanna take um, a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes and do uh, some learning that the actual text that I'm gonna present are not presented in the book. I tell the story, but I don't actually bring the text. So if you already read the book, Hopefully this will, this will uh, give you uh, uh, new insights that you weren't able to see. Um, this is, I think, really one of my favorite stories. I love it also because people don't know or never heard of it before. And because it plays such an important role in terms of everything that um, I do today. So this is a story, one of the many stories of Reb Chaim Yosef David Azulai, the Chida. We're just going to call him the Chida. Um, and I'll tell you just a little bit about his story. The Chida grew up in uh, Jerusalem. We're talking 18th century, okay? Um, the story we're gonna learn is about from 1775, but he grew up in the 18th century. He spent his time going back and forth between uh, the Jewish community in Hebron and in Jerusalem. Um, I think he's probably within the top 100 most influential rabbis of all time. I'm trying really hard through this book to get him into like the top 10. Um, so, you know, cast your vote uh, that after you hear this story of why I think he should be in the top 10. He wrote over a hundred books, uh, commentaries on everything imaginable. But what I really love about the Chida is that he had a private diary. Um, he traveled throughout uh, much of Europe, uh, raising money for the small Jewish community in Hebron. Um, but he really saw this as a deep religious mission and he is a major rock star. He's like one of the greatest rabbis of his generation. So when he shows up in their community, it would be like, you know, the greatest rabbi of your generation all of a sudden showing up. Everybody wants to have his favor. Everybody wants to get close to him. And here he is writing about um, his diary, his, his, um, his, his challenges. As I said, I noted um, that I wanted to uh, dedicate, excuse me, um, that I'm dedicating this learning to my stepfather, to Abi Isaacs. There's a story in, uh, in his diary, in the Chida's diary, where he talks about uh, that he's traveling and his, uh, and his wife passes away. And uh, he gets a note of it and he's, um, and he describes how he's challenged with this depression um, and how he's still trying to do communal work and try and help others, but he's deeply depressed. And it's an amazing story where he doesn't even want to have anyone know uh, that she passed away because he, he's afraid that they're going to force him as a single man traveling through Europe to have to get married. And it's and in his diary, he's kind of writing this sort of love letter for his wife that he misses, that he was so close with. So he met with Christian clergy when he would go, he would go uh, to the museums, he would meet, he would go to the libraries. Um, my kids all know that every city that we've traveled to uh, in Europe, we're always going to be traveling to where the Chida went to. So if he went to, you know, the botanical gardens in Amsterdam, we have to go to the botanical gardens in Amsterdam. Anyway, I'll stop going on about my, uh, how, how I'm starstruck by him. Uh, he was later, he was buried in Livorno and later brought over for burial in Jerusalem in the 1950s. Now I'm gonna tell you one of his many stories that I write about in chapter five, okay? So the scene, here's the scene. We are in Ancona, Italy, okay? Here's Ancona, Italy. 
We were in Ancona, Italy, August 18, 1775. Dear diary, I put that in. Um, today, we came in peace to Ancona and we settled into the house of the nobleman Pinchaskoy. There's going to be a few names, so uh, you'll stay. I'll try, try not to lose you. But one of the key names is Pinchas, super wealthy uh, uh, Jew living in Ancona, Italy, that, Pinch, that the Chida is staying in his house. Okay, so now, September 17th, he writes into his diary that he becomes aware of the conflict. I went to the wealthy community leaders, David and Isaac Cohen, the brothers-in-law of Pinchas. And for 12 years, they had been in a tremendous machlok, tremendous conflict with Senor Pinchas and his wife, their sister. And they had a lawsuit for almost 30,000 Italia scudi and cardinals, and bishops, and other senior Christian clergy, as well as rabbis, all tried over time to make peace between them, but to no avail, as the hatred between them was too great. So here he's writing as he's, he's, he's writing about what I'm calling defining the conflict, okay? What's at the heart of the conflict that's been going on for 12 years between Pinchas on the one hand and his wife and David and Isaac, their brothers-in-law and their wives on the other. So on the one hand, he says explicitly, there's a lawsuit. Family is suing other parts of the family for 30,000 Italian scudi, which is a lot of money. I don't know how much exactly. And who has not tried mediating this intractable conflict? Okay, we're going to find out at the end that the Pope himself and Kona, Italy is directly under papal control. The Pope was still a political leader at this time period. That the Pope himself had been involved in trying to mediate the conflict. That means that these families are incredibly powerful. Okay, But note that the conflict is not only about the 30,000 Italian scudi. It's not only about the money. It's also that he says they didn't succeed because the hatred between them was too great. I want you to have in mind, as we go through this story and as we go into this conversation this evening, that the conflict and any conflict can be divided up into what are the material components of the conflict, the scarcity of resource conflict. It could be land, it could be money, it could be a, you know all these different types of tangible, what's the conflict over? And then there's the whole, what about the fact that they really hate each other, okay? There's a terrible breakdown in the relationship. How do we work between those two different traps, those two different needs? One can be defined often as a process of conflict resolution. There's a conflict, let's resolve it and divide it up. The other is about reconciliation. How do we heal the relationship between these two parties that are so deeply in hatred? Okay, so here we have Humpty Dumpty. No one can put it back together again. Okay. First thing, taking the initiative. I mentioned that it's very typical of traditional models of conflict resolution, that the third party does not wait to get invited, um, but will we'll, we'll step right in. And this is what he writes, again, as part of the same diary entry on September 17th. And a spirit came over my young self, by the way, I think he's in his late 50s here. I love that he says my young self. And I spoke words of tohacha. Admonition, and he starts yelling to Senor David, and I appeased him such that he would make peace with everyone. And he was supposed to go to Venice after Rosh Hashanah, 10 days from then. I told him they had to cancel the trip, and his brother, Senor Isaac, helped me greatly. And it was settled that he, David Cohen, would make peace with everyone, except, except that I and Rabbi Israel, or Rabbi Yisrael, who is, who is, parentheses, the new young rabbi, he's young, he's only been in the community for two or three years, so he's the local rabbi in Ancona, that the two of us will judge the money at stake between them, and that will be done according to the strict law of Torah without compromise. Let's be very clear on what's happening here. First, he's taking the initiative. They didn't say, can you come and mediate our conflict? He's sitting in their house He's staying with the brother-in-law that they haven't talked to for 12 years, okay? And his goal, by the way, is he's just trying to raise money for the community that sends it. 
So he's giving Tochacha, which, as I mentioned, Cow- Howard Kaminsky's book has a, about 100 pages about Tochacha and constructive dialogue, comparing contemporary dialogue theory with, with the halachas of Tocha. Um, he's telling him, you have to cancel your trip. We're settling this right now. And he convinced everyone that they're going to make peace, right? But the, the financial aspect of the dispute will be settled by strict law. So he's splitting between the relationship aspect, that there will be peace, and the financial aspect, that there will be not compromise, but strict law as to who gets the money and who doesn't get the money. So he created a certain type of roadmap for how how this is going to be forward. He's going to be the arbitrator, okay? Step three of what the Chida does is he establishes the third-party peacemakers and commitment of all sides to the process. So he then describes, this is all within the same, within the same entry, and I rose and went to the aforementioned rabbi, meaning Rabbi Yisrael, the local rabbi, and he was happy with what I said. And we arose and went to the aforementioned noblemen, and we obtained from them a commitment and promise to abide by whatever we ruled. And after that, we went to Senor Pinchas, the brother-in-law, and we obtained from them and from their wives also commitment and promise. And it was a great and awesome wonder. So what does he do? He gets everyone to sign in that this is the process. Me, the Chida, with Rabbi Yisrael, are going to be doing two different tracks. We're going to be reconciling your relationship, as we're going to see in a moment. And at the same time, we're going to be ruling strict law as to who gets what, who gets what with, the, with the money. So here we got our Batman and Robin. So now we're five days later, okay? September 22nd is the next entry in his diary where he talks about the conflict. In the yeshiva, um, in the yeshiva, adjacent to the houses of the noblemen, Pinchas, David, and Isaac, which is the academy of those noblemen, everyone came, they and their wives, and the aforementioned rabbi, and I and my young self, and shalom was made, praise to Hashem, toda la Hashem. I remember when I read this entry uh, first, it was two o'clock in the morning. I had just come home from one of my close friends, Hanan Benayahu's house, who grandfather was a chief rabbi who was responsible for bringing the Chida's body, bones, for burial in Jerusalem in the 1950s. And he had the Chida's diary in his house. He said, go look for conflict stories here. This is the story that I found. So when I got to entry number three on this story, I said, that's the end of the story. 12 years they've been in conflict. They got the money. They have all these different things. And it said peace was made. They came. What did he do? He brought the sides of the conflict. Okay. Pinchas, David, Isaac, all into a shared common holy space, the yeshiva or the, or the, or the synagogue that they all, by the way, are supporting, right? They didn't create two different institutions. They still all support it. They all come in and then they had peace. And I didn't understand what, was there an agreement? Did, did, did they sign something? How do they work it out? It took me a while to understand, only after I read in the story later, did I understand that the meaning of shalom, according to the Chida, means reconciliation. It's not a conflict resolution yet. That we'll talk about. Shalom means that they have begun to have normalization of relations. They're talking again. They're just sitting in the room. They're in the space, engaging one another. This is what conflict resolution specialist, for example, uh, Lisa Shrish, I never pronounced her last name, my apology, refers to as um, creating these sacred spaces, that these, that these sacred spaces, uh, ritual space, create a shared identity that is part of the reconciliation of relationships that are going to play an important role. That doesn't mean they're entirely reconciled, but it means that shalom, meaning that they're starting to be connected again with each other. September 23rd, Shabbat. On the holy Shabbat day, I went with Senor Pinchas to the house of God, meaning I went back to, to, the, to the synagogue. And I went with Senor Pinchas and Senor David and Senor Isaac 
And afterwards, they came to the house of Senor Kalai and said, eh, skipping. And we went to their sister, meaning he's just describing how they're walking from one house to the other house. It seems like what they're doing is they're kind of going on a Shabbat walk. He's basically taking one and he's saying, you're going to now say Shabbat Shalom to this one. And don't be afraid I'm with you. If I'm with you, they're going to treat you respectfully and you're going to treat them respectfully because it's the presence of the Chida and the role modeling um, of who he is and what his mission is to bring about reconciliation. It's what it's allowing them again to have a normalization of relations, that they're publicly, um, you know, strolling the streets, visiting each other's homes, things that family members should be doing brothers-in-laws and sisters-in-law should be doing, but they haven't done it for 12 years because they've been so stuck. Okay. Now comes the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Okay. September 24th. Rabbi Yisrael called for me. And I said to him that I was engaged in solitary meditation. So he went by himself and made peace between Senor Consul and Senor Kalai, another part of the conflict and his wife, but it didn't hold. It didn't work. And ultimately they said that I was not present which was why the peace was unsustainable, but the peace that I made did help. And then he says, the 10 days of repentance, the Amim Noraim, um, I was alone and separate in the room uh, within, uh, within Pinchas' house, meaning he literally would do, he would quarantine for 10 days, okay? Uh, for him, that was a meditative process that he was from a very deeply Kabbalistic uh, tradition. Um, but what's important, in this diary entry for me is that the young Rabbi Yisrael is like, we have this amazing track record. We're like three and oh, and we've never won a game before in 12 years. And like, everybody's talking with each other and everyone's making peace with each other. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. It's Arab Rosh Hashanah. It's, it's Rosh Hashanah Eve. Let's don't sit in your house. And, and, and the Chida is like, you go, I need to just meditate. <laughs> And what I love about this is that so many people who go into the profession of trying to save the world get really burnt out because they destroy their inner world, either physically or spiritually. And what the Chida is saying in his diary, I needed to create some type of boundaries that, yes, pursuing peace is super important, but my inner peace and relationship to God and having that space and holding that space is not less important and it's going to ultimately allow him to continue to keep on going with this conflict that is going to go on and on and on okay october november this is the next cheshvan the next time that he writes a diary entry about this conflict he's writing about other things in his diary and he describes how rabbi small came to my home came to my room to work on the case of the Cohen noblemen or the Cohen brothers and their dispute over several claims in business inheritance property, uh, property holdings and property damages, close to 70 details and claims from three Cohen's and between, um, uh, three Cohen's in between Senor David and Senor Kalai, many deep matters. Meaning this is not just about 30,000 Skude coins. There's 70 lawsuits this family member has sued each other over. And I, by God's grace, may he be praised, was working on my book, Birke Yosef, which he's sitting and writing his book, while he's traveling, okay, he wrote, this is one of his commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, the, 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 the most classic of, of Jewish codes. Only when the aforementioned rabbi came and I looked, came in, I looked into the aforementioned laws with him. And after I had returned to my studies, he, he yet labored at night and before sunrise in those matters. And with Hashem's, with God's help, I had enough of my time alone with him. And we had many arguments between us but it was all with respect and great love, praise to God, praise to Hashem. I love the fact that he's talking about his chavruta. He's talking about his study partner with this young Rabbi Yisrael, who's sort of like his research assistant, doing, looking up all the books about what to do about these 70 lawsuits of all of the Torah has to do with. And he's, and he's like, I need to hold that space for myself to continue writing my book, because that's important to me. And at the same time, he's like, and we're sitting there arguing about it, but it's with love and respect. And again, just that, that beautiful machloka that Shem Shemayim, disagreeing with the sake of heaven, kind of comes in here. Moving forward, November, December. This conflict is going on and on, right? He's already finished doing what he had to do there, by the way, in August. Okay, he's only staying because of the conflict. Here, um, 
he describes that another third party comes into the conflict. This time it's a shared loved niece. She is Signorita Sara, who comes in from Pizarro. And he describes, I won't read it inside, but he describes how all family members see this as an opportunity to have a festive party. Now he's not the one holding their hand saying, come with me, let's say Shabbat Shalom to this other family. But now they're all coming together and having this shared party for an honor of their shared niece who they all love. And he describes how they're toasting each other and how they're getting drunk and how this is enhancing the peace. And he's like, and I'm just sitting on the corner at like, I barely am eating some fish because I'm so deeply uncomfortable and I'm just talking words of Torah with Rabbi Israel. And like, you have this like lavish Italian rich party going on. And he's like, I know this is important that my presence is here. But again, you see the self-sacrifice of the peacemaker that he's like, I would really rather be learning Torah in the synagogue or at my home right now than being at this party where everyone's drunk. But I know this is part of the peace. It's part of the shalom of reconciliation that they're doing without him. But now comes time for reality. What about the lawsuit? What about the scarcity of resource? What about the land? What about the actual conflict? December, January, we're in the month of Tevet. He said, we finally concluded our investigation into the case and the communal leaders, according to our understanding. Um, and he said, and we finally came up with a verdict. And then there's only one problem. They know what the answers are for the 70 lawsuits, for the 30,000 scudi, but we have a problem. Have we realized that the only thing that would come out of it, meaning the verdict, was utter destruction and greater hatred by now, we, we told everyone we're going to give them strict law, that there would be no compromise. Strict law. We're the arbitrators. But now we have a problem that if I hand over this verdict, all of this reconciliation work, all of this peacemaking work that's happened for the last several months, all is going to be out the drain, down the drain. Therefore, we decided to make a valiant effort to mediate between them and to bring them to a compromise agreement. And the truth is that it was incredibly difficult, such as words cannot even describe it, if it were not for God, for Hashem, who granted us wisdom and patience and creative ideas. And we finally brought them to a compromise agreement about the lawsuits, about the damages between neighbors and inheritance and all these things. And it took them several more months. And Hashem is our savior. Several more months he's sacrificing of his time being away from his family in order to now bring them about to a compromise agreement and not just strict law because he's so worried it's going to hurt the relationship. But they wouldn't have been able to convince him to go to a track of compromise if they were in the beginning of the relationship where they hated each other several months ago. Finally, they dealt, they, they, in, in Nissan, the first of Nissan in March 21st, they hand over the verdict regarding the, 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 the actual financial dispute, the 30,000 Skudai, and he describes how they went crazy and how how, 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 how uh, Senor uh, David gets so angry that, Mao, that, that, he's, that, he, that words cannot describe how upset he was and how he had to try to calm him down. I'm skipping. And then they have the, the ceremonial oath where they all three uh, family members all say that we accept upon ourselves uh, the verdict in addition to the compromise agreement that he already had brought about. Um, um, I'll skip. And then after Passover on the 29th of Nisan, they bring it back to the papal courts. And you have the, the scribe of the Pope write in that after all these years, that the Pope himself, the Papa himself, as he writes, tried to mediate this conflict and had failed, that this one came from Jerusalem and he succeeded. And the, and the Chida saw this as a great sanctification of God's name, that, that they were finally able to bring about peace. And he really saw that the, that the, the, the hatred in the world is the real cause of, of illness, is going back to what David was saying about the healing component. He really believed that this isn't just about a conflict between these individuals. This is about the, 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 the sinat chinam, the baseless hatred that's happening in the world that's, that's uh, prolonging um, the, 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 the sadness, the destruction 
uh, of the world and not bringing about redemption. And then finally, on the 21st of April, all family members uh, ride off with him, escort him to the next city where you can believe is waiting him the next major conflict that he has to go and resolve. So why did I share that whole long story other than the fact that I'm just a huge uh, Chida groupie, as, I, as I've noted? One, and with this, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to conclude and, and open up for questions. I mentioned to you the sulha process, right? I mentioned to you, we didn't go into it in depth. I said to you in the first chapter of my book, I talk about the sulha process, which is the Arab, uh, the traditional Arab way of making peace. The Arab way of making peace, the traditional sulha process is the exact opposite of what the Sikhida just did. That's not a cultural difference because the Chida was basically a Palestinian Jew and he would do the exact same type of sulha process in general, but he did it out of order. And this is very important to understand in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The traditional sulha process always starts with there was an offense. It could be a scarcity of reason. It could be there was a financial component. It could be that there was a murder, but that is a breakdown in relationship. And out of honor, there is no normalization of relationships until justice has been served. The two sides are not allowed to meet. The two sides are never allowed to have any interaction with each other until the third party goes back and forth, brings about a just agreement, a verdict that everyone accepts. And after there has been justice, then there is reconciliation. The Chida did the opposite. The Chida first and foremost brought about reconciliation. He had them meeting each other's homes, drinking coffee again together, having Shabbat meals again together, walking around together, toasting each other together. All that reconciliation is happening in the story. And only after they stop hating each other can he then get them onto a pragmatic possibility of how are we going to solve the insolvable material aspects of the conflict. And here's the thing. The material aspects of the conflict are impossible to solve when people hate each other. And that the Chida understood. So which comes first? Conflict resolution, meaning first solve scarcity of resource, the material, the land disputes, who gets what, and then you can have normalization and reconciliation. Or first you have reconciliation, Let's be friendly with each other. Let's know each other. Let's play football together. And afterwards, we can come to an agreement over how to divide up the land. In, in, in contemporary peace-building theory, and with this, uh, this I'll, I'll, I'll conclude, this is known as the, as the debate between structural peace-building and cultural peace-building. Okay? Those of you who are in the first session with me will note that some of the questions were asked from both of these directions. Okay? Structural peace-building is often more identified with what the Palestinians are interested in, which is let's solve the structural problems of the conflict, land, occupation, all of those components that, of the structural uh, aspect. And then we can start talking about reconciliation, normalization. No normalization until that happened. The, 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 the other side is cultural. The, the Jewish Israelis are often craving for let's first meet each other, have each other at each other's homes. Let's get to know each other. Let's have, let's learn with each other. Let's, let's play with each other. Let's know that we don't hate each other. If I know you don't hate me, then we'll be able to have the trust to be able to deal with the structural aspects of the conflict. But there's a third possibility, which is what the work that we're involved in, which is elite religious peace building. That if you're engaging the top religious leaders that have major influence over the structural aspects of the conflict, and also over the cultural aspects of the conflict, you're able to relate to both at the same time. So I'm going to pause here. I went longer than I had wanted, although I also had started a bit later because of uh, our technical difficulties, and and open up for any questions you have about um, anything I just said or didn't say. Well, maybe I'll start us off with a question that's just been on my mind since, uh, especially since you signal like the, the slide, they're like, pay attention to this, rabbis. Um, the idea that like, <laughs> you know, that someone like me could be involved in this, it, it, it like at once seems kind of laughable because I know myself. But on the other hand, um, I, it makes me wonder, 
uh, about what it would take to be a person who was uh, capable of doing this. And I guess I wonder, I mean, here with the Chida that you gave like one really major and fascinating example, like, is he, I guess, I guess my question is, because I know in some ways your next session will be about how we can start to think about doing, doing this kind of um, work or what it means. I guess I'm wondering. That's the last session. Last session. <laughs> I guess I'm wondering, um, like what I'm wondering in general about that, what that training would be. But the, the way I'll ask the question is, do you think that it takes someone who's just wise, like the Chida was just a wise person, or do you think he was steeped in the particular methods and, um, and tradition of peacemaking that he had learned from his Torah, that he studied this and he knew how to do it? You know, does it take a wise person or does it take a studied person? I guess is the way I want to ask that question. That makes sense. You you are now frozen. Maybe we lost him. Yeah. Oh, you're um, back. I think that the the you are back. You were frozen for a sec, but you are back. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. It's a little choppy, but I think we're now getting you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you can. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Not everyone. Not everyone can be a chida. Okay. Not everyone can be Aaron. And I think one of the things that I try to highlight in my book is that um, there are lots of stories, as I mentioned, the jesters. Okay, that becomes actually this paradigmatic paradigmatic model of. Uh, of everyone has to be able to be a peacemaker within their own context. It's not only the Aaron, the high priest, there's only one high priest at a time, but there's only one peacemaker. But I think when we look at the, 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 the case study that we went in depth in about the Chida, it's not necessarily one person. Like when I think about it conceptually in, in our work, and, and as I mentioned, the road Fei Shalom, he himself also didn't try to make peace by himself. He knew he needed to have a local person because he's leaving in, in eight months. By the way, that story took eight months. Eight months he invested in his life to try to resolve that. But he knew that when he leaves, somebody has to continue to be in touch with those parties. So he's empowering Rabbi Yisrael. But so when I think about, you know, the work that, literally I was doing before this Zoom and literally I'm going to be doing right after we finish this Zoom is how am I empowering, um, how am I going to bring in the most influential religious leaders from the heads of the Muslim Brotherhood in Qatar, okay, to the religious leaders in Kfar Qasim or in Umul Fahim or in Ofra, depending on what we're talking about religious side. So I had a situation today where I was talking to, where I'm trying to, to, to flip a local, very influential, very right-wing religious Zionist rabbi in a mixed city to, to start being part of our network. And one of the things I did is I mentioned, by the way, your rabbi has been part of this for 20 years, but he never told you. <laughs> rabbi Gisser, who we're going to learn about next week. And when he said, ah, okay, I didn't realize he, he never, you know, I didn't realize, I would love to hear more about it. So it's, 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 it's part of creating a network that, that you have together these people that kind of create uh, the Chida. I, another conversation I had today in, in the city of Lod, where there was another murder uh, just the other day between two warring families. And the question I was talking about with the Sheikh there is, who can step in to be the third party? Like, who's influential and well enough respected by the parties in conflict that can help resolve it? And he's like, there just isn't. I'm like, well, we have to build up that chidat. Like, who's that person that this one on top of that one with that one together and all those connections, they can then be the game changer. And the same thing is happening with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not going to be one religious leader or one diplomat. It's a network of people all kind of working together and pulling their connections but all the way to the extremes. So again, the Chida and Aaron, they're, they're models, but they're also a kind of a conceptual model 
Um, but I will, as I said in the fourth session and, and continue to encourage that I think each one of us has our connections. It could be within our family. It could be within our community. It could be within our, you know, whatever your web of connections are, assuming you are a well-adjusted human being with well of connections, you can play that role of the insider because you're connected to that side and that side. And if there's a conflict, what are you going to do about it? Obviously, there's the skills. But the Chida was successful first and foremost, not just because of his wisdom in peacemaking. It was because of his wisdom in Torah. He was well-respected. And the bishop and the pope, they were not in, respected as insiders in the same way. And also, I think that they were not sitting there with them at the Shabbat table. They're thinking only about the financial aspects and not about the reconciliation component that he knew as knowing the codes how to get involved in. But Rabbi Yisrael himself couldn't do it without the chida. He needed to bring in bigger guns to help him. It's a great answer. Great answer. Thank you. Um, let me turn it over to Rabbi Browse and then to Janet, who we each have questions. Janet, you can go first. I saw, I saw your hand before mine. That's okay. I'm sure what you have to say is wiser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, um, but thank you so much. Um, this is incredible, Rabbi Roth, and I'm so grateful um, to you for sharing this with us. I, I mean, it, it's it's just so clear that, I mean, what you're arguing is that the, the, natural, the natural inclination um, if in, if among Jews for the way that we approach peace building and the way that among, among Arabs or among Muslims, and I'm not exactly sure if it's both or one or the other, is really fundamentally different. And that's why this whole anti-normalization is such a, is so grievous for us. It's like, it feels like, but how can, you won't even be in conversation with me? How are we supposed to know each other if we won't be in conversation? And yet it's the, that's the, the basic foundation of the process, of the Sulcha process from what you're describing. And it seems like elite religious peace, you're, you're arguing that at least elite religious peace building is the is the only way to sort of break the lo the the lock um, between these two? Correct. Like there, there will never we won't be out, there's no other way around this because these are deeply embedded cultural differences. Um, and I wonder, and so that's why your work matters so deeply and profoundly. And I also have to believe that there have to be other ways to break this uh, to to sort of br break the impasse here. That there can't only be one way of getting through because not everybody has the ability. I mean, even what you're describing between you and Rabbi Kesher are describing, it, it requires a certain measure of um, knowledge, respect, you know, community leadership in order to be in that role. And so um, it seems like there has to also, there have to also be other mechanisms that or, or other levers that we can pull. Otherwise we're basic, the rest of us are sort of standing back and waiting um, for, for the few who have the ability to stand in the breach in this way to resolve the conflict, given that there's such profoundly different cultural norms in, in the way that the two communities engage conflict. What it, uh, an excellent question. I'm so happy that you, that you, that you brought that up. Look, we, you and I started this last session quoting uh, uh, Mark Gopin as a, uh, as a shared source of inspiration. Mark told me many, many years ago, many years ago, he said, what Jews need and what Palestinians need are very different. Ju Palestinians need justice. Jews need recognition that they have, you know, that they're, that they're a certain degree of legitimacy and they need to work through the narrative issues. They need to work through the cultural issues. So. I am a big believer in parallel play. Um, um, that you know, if, if I if I can say it in contrast to a lot of how um, uh, European um, uh, European Union grants or U.S. aid grants, traditionally a lot of big foundations are always very stuck in a uh, a Western paradigm of conflict resolution of saying let's take 10 of these and 10 of those and put them together 10 times and then they'll get to know each other and then and then everything will be okay i just found out today that in in we we as i said we support 12 mixed cities okay we just got a government grant for uh working more for deeper work in the mixed cities and one of the heads of mediation center in Akko calls me up and she says, you're not going to believe this. The money has to go towards 10 of these and 10 of those in doing healing processes between Jews and Arabs. She's like, but that's totally disconnected from reality because what the 
Arab population needs in the mixed cities is to get the mafia families off the streets because they have a, are plagued with crime and violence. That's different what the Jews need. And to, to, to ignore the differences of the need for justice and equality that the Arab population needs, and I would say, as an extrapolation, the Palestinians need is different than what the Jews need, which is more of the cultural peace building. So I think that there has to be ways that, um, that to engage in structural peace building, to support that work, and to be able to support cultural peace building. I think it's a mistake to only invest in one or the other. And unfortunately, we'll see, there was this new uh, Lowy grant with, with more money coming in from the USA to support Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. I, I'm concerned that it still is still stuck in a paradigm of bring contact and contact, ignoring the fact that the Palestinians do not want to have normalization until justice is served, because that doesn't end the occupation from their perspective. The Israelis crave it, because without addressing the hatred they don't trust to be able to get to a peace agreement. So we need to be able to work with those two needs in parallel and yet move things forward. Thank you. And yes, and yes, the elite peace builders go around that because because the heads of Hamas and Fatah and the, all the Israel, they all know that they're doing it. So nobody, nobody, uh, nobody gives them a hard time. Janet, yes. My question has to do with the power imbalance, which is what you've just described. Um, and in Ireland, between the Protestants and the, and the Catholics, there was a different power imbalance than there is within the mixed cities and within the Israeli population and the Palestinians. And so I was wondering how in building this structure, you take into consideration the total imbalance. Thank you. Power, power imbalance. Thank you. Yeah. So I, again, my mind is constantly on two different levels because I'm thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I'm thinking about the mixed cities, which is a, for me sort of a microcosm of the uh, of the of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'll I'll start with the mixed cities because I'm very very engaged in that. Um, I just hired, literally uh, hired a very influential sheikh, who is going to be serving as a mediator. Now, people could say, why are you hiring a sheikh? Well, because he's been doing it pro bono for years, literally risking his life, okay? Uh, he took me and my 19-year-old son the other night to a sulha where there were crime families and 50 people who had just been fighting for two years do a whole sulha process. And I need to invest in empowering him because he doesn't have the salary that the rabbi has. He doesn't have the NGOs and the government money and the, and, the, and the Jewish funders that are supporting them. He has nobody supporting him. So I need to bring in more funds to help uh, train and, and address the power imbalance. It doesn't look pretty for, for spreadsheets. It doesn't look pretty for what people are saying. Well, why is it not symmetrical? Because the conflict is symmetrical. because there is a different need that everybody has. He's putting his life at his risk. Uh, he's putting his life at risk every day as he goes to war against crime families and tries to get the kids off of drugs and prostitution and other challenges that are happening in the inner cities of these of these of these Arab communities. So if he succeeds, when he succeeds, then then I will introduce him to the rabbi. But as equals that he is now that he's become strengthened and that there are results and then there's a place for, for having them ha have that encounter. And I think the same thing with the Palestinians. I wish that there would be just money strictly going into the Arab sector and just going into building a democratic or, or, or stronger civil society culture within the Palestinian territories that has nothing to do with them meeting Jews. But yet so many, uh, so much of the, of, the, of the theory of change behind USAID grants, for example, is like, well, so long as they're meeting the Jews, so you're doing all these things that they have to meet Jews just to be able to support their basic infrastructure that's needed. There is a power imbalance that needs to be addressed. Equality must come as a prerequisite before we can talk about shared societies and, 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 and encounters. My dream is, by the way, I want the rabbi 
from the right wing community in the mixed city advocating for the lack of justice of his friend, the sheikh, who's there. That's what we're doing. That it's not the sheikh advocating going out and saying, why are there 130 people that have been killed in my streets? But it's the rabbi who's going side by side with him. And that's where we're getting to. Um, I see we're coming to the end of our time. Does anyone have, we have time for another question if someone has one. And if not, I'll, I'll turn it, it to, back to Rabbi Rath if you want to signal at all where we'll be headed next time or give us homework. Yeah, I have a closing slide in the homework, yeah. Great. You want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Does that make sense? Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, let's hope I got to the right one. You see this? Okay, so I just wanted to, to conclude. Can you, can you see this, David? Yes, indeed. Okay. I just want oops, just want to conclude with the with the cover of my book, which I love. Um, it's really hard picking and covering a book because it's like, when am I going to put like a like a picture of Aaron making peace, a picture of the chida? Like, what what was the cover? Um, so if you look very carefully, there's some uh, Hebrew writing on the cover, um, and it's a text that I found that I feel like really sums up the book and the essence of the work here. Um, and it's from Rav Haim Falaji, who also, I would argue, top 100 rabbis ever want to move him up, not into the top 10, but top 20 in terms of being well-known. And he wrote in his living diary, Tzavat Mi'achayim, he wrote this text saying, may God in his mercy give me the strength to make a special charity fund that should, comp that should comprise special individuals who will serve as Ruth Fei Shalom, peace, pursuers of peace, as in the case of other holy committees, like clever Kaddishas, um, in, other, in order that as soon as they hear of a conflict between two individuals or within the community, they should be able to dedicate all their efforts and make peace between them. Their membership in this committee is conditional on their taking a formal strict oath that they will not become angry at all, even if people curse them and hit them, and they should be careful not to speak harshly and to be patient and there is no doubt that if they do this thing, they bring redemption closer. And it goes without saying that they themselves should not be engaged in conflicts at all and, be, should, and should be forgiving. And a great benefit comes out of such a gathering for the sake of heaven. And there is no need to spend money at all on this, except for a community official who will be responsible for gathering the road face shalom together. And when I read that text uh, years ago, of saying of this person who is dreaming that one day there would be these road face shalom in each community like who are the insider mediators the, the pursuers of peace within each community that every time something happens like just like we all know we need a chesed committee and everyone knows that we need a you know a committee to, to escort those when they pass away that he dreamed of a committee of road face shalom and when i saw that i had a friend of mine who is a uh, who's a scribe also works in high tech um Write, write it out, as you see on the bottom right-hand corner, on um, parchment paper, like written as in the um, Hippocratic Oath, like it would be written out like a Torah scroll, right down the middle of the page to show that this text is meeting between the extremes. And then we give that out to rabbis and rabbaniot, to, uh, to, to men and women um, religious leaders. I've given it to a couple of sheikhs also, by the way, that they hang it up in their office. Um, as a sign of what are we trying to do and remember. And so for me, that kind of sums up a lot of the book of text, uh, theory, and, and the practice uh, of today. So homework, this was a, looking a little bit more historically and looking a little more at the theory. The, the, uh, the homework is for next session. I asked that people have a chance to read over this, uh, my article. Insider Religious Mediators in the Context of the Palestinian Conflict. There's also an article, if you took the booklet, by Ofer Zaltzberg, my colleague, who goes through the eight, eight narratives of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or eight worldviews that are in conflict, 
as not to to understand how we what are the conflicts and what's the history of people trying to the history of mediation in the conflict and where have they all fallen short. So if you can read that, that's great, and we'll have an in-depth conversation about that work. Thank you. Thanks so much for this. This is um this has just been